Good evening or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining us for this South African exclusive book launch of Guy Raz's How I Built This. Thank you to Workshop 17 and Pan Macmillan for making this possible. And thank you to Guy Raz, who's joining us from Northern California this morning. Hello. Welcome, Guy. Hello. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Yeah, this is so awesome. Uh, there's been a big buzz in our office this week uh, in anticipation of this opportunity to speak to you. We're extremely privileged and and thankful and grateful to have you here with us uh, to discuss this amazing book, uh, which goes along with an amazing podcast that um, I believe is is a movement. You like to talk about how I built this as the story behind the stories of people who built movements and not just businesses. And I think uh, what you've done qualifies as a movement and this incredible story. And we'll get into that uh, today. When the history of podcasting is told in a podcast, uh, there are a few names that are going to be singled out as pioneers and godfathers of the industry. And I think, um, you know, our guest tonight is going to be one of those people. Um, how does it make you feel when you hear that guy, when you look back and you see what you've achieved in this industry that uh, not too long ago was so nascent and new? Well, it's very hard to process because I don't really believe it, to be honest. If, if you say, well, you know, you're going to be this like historical figure in podcasting. It doesn't I don't really know if if that means anything or, or, or what. I mean, I think about like, you know, the, the, the founding of the, like like radio, you know, and like how many people talk about, you know, I don't know. I, I, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, I love I love this idea that I, that people think of me as a pioneer in in podcasting and this this medium. I think really the reality is I got lucky because I was in it early, and I've I've been in audio my whole career. So it used to be we used to call it radio, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then one day I I was like, all right, I guess I'm a podcaster. Um, so it you know, but but I I I, I appreciate the sentiment in the sense that I really take what I do very seriously. And I, I spend a lot of time and I've spent a lot of time over my career and continue to and continue to try to get better at making really great content, really great, not just the, the way, not just the information that we offer, but the way it sounds, the way we put it together. And, the, and, and I try and think about everything I do from the listener's experience because the way I think about content is, um, you know, if I'm listening to something, I want to walk away from it feeling like it was worth my time. And we all have such limited amount of time, such a limited amount of time. And so I'm always, I mean, every time we put out a new episode and we put out three episodes of How I Built This a Week and I do Wisdom from the Top and a kid's show, I swear to God, every single week, I'm constantly anxious because I'm like, our listeners... Am I going to waste a listener's time this week? I'm I'm constantly like under that kind of self-imposed pressure to make something that I feel I would want to listen to, and then hoping that listeners would agree. So, long-winded answer, but it's it's pretty cool. I mean, I I <laughs> I, I I love being a resource for people, and I and I you know, and I I if I can be, that's it's amazing. You know, we, we were talking uh, just before we went on air, how much work goes into each one of your episodes. And, I, and a lot of people think, um, you know, just with the proliferation of so many podcasts out there in the world right now, I mean, you know, there's over a million podcasts in the English speaking language. Uh, a lot of them are two people just sitting down. There's various different formats. Um, but I think it really shows in the quality of the work that you guys do that there's a hell of a lot of research that goes into each one of those episodes. Just maybe take us through quickly, you know, what goes into each episode and also yeah. how do you choose the subjects uh, to be invited onto the show? So um, I'll start with the, the second part of the question, which is we don't really have a, it's not a science, you know, it's more like an art. I mean, we have a kind of a loose formula, but it's very subjective. That's the reality. But there are basic criteria we look for. Um, first and foremost, the person that we interview has to speak, unfortunately, has to speak clear English because it's audio only. If it was a video, it would be a little easier. We could do subtitles. and But doing um, translation on an audio format is still really challenging. You can do it, but it's challenging to connect with a person when you don't hear their voice. So that, that of course, kind of rules out um, people who don't speak English. So it's, a, it's you know, it's take it for what, what that is. 
but the really the most important quality we look for is um, is integrity and and kindness. Now, what do I mean by that? We found ourselves shortly after we launched the show in in a kind of a dilemma, which was all of a sudden we realized our audience was growing very fast. This is four years ago, and and in in, in you know soon enough we were getting a million people listening a week, and now it's three and a half million. Now, with that number of people listening to our show every week, we have come to understand <laughs> that we have a great deal of power, whether we like it or not, whether we we want that power or not, we have it because all these people are coming to our show. And so, so many people think about our show when they think about entrepreneurship, they, they're, they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. And so even though we didn't ask for that power, we have it. And as Spider-Man says, with power comes responsibility. So we very quickly realized that we had to represent the kind of entrepreneurship we want people to pursue. When we want people to think about entrepreneurship, I don't want people to think about shady pitch, men, pitch person, you know, mm -hmm. or some, you know, dishonest kind of business scheme. I want people to think about people really earnestly trying to make a change, trying to solve a problem and trying to offer a product product or a service that is, um, you know, that, that the world needs. And so we, we think about the integrity of the person, um, how they treat the people they work with and, and who work for them. Um, are they, you know, um, um, and that's, that's the basic criteria. It, it's, you know, we also focus on consumer facing products and services. So we have a bias towards things that you could buy at a store that you would see on the shelf and say, oh, I heard that on how I built this, or I know this product, mm -hmm. you know. We tend not to do a whole lot of back-end um, stories like B2B companies. There are other podcasts for that. We tend to focus on consumer-facing products. We don't do that much tech. A lot of people think we're a tech show. Mm -hmm. Only about 10% of our shows have been about tech enterprises like Slack and uh, Airbnb and, and Lyft. Um, but we generally focus on consumer facing products. Um, probably most of them are US focused and based because we are a US based show. But I think, you know, even though we have quite a significant international audience, um, you know, in the world we live in today, people know what, you know, people can just do a web search and understand that, you know, Stacy's pita chips is a pretty big deal in the US, for example. <laughs> um, when it comes to actually putting the show together, we contact that person. And by the way, we receive about a thousand pitches a week. Well, that's just wow. me. My other producers probably receive, you know, hundreds. It's about a thousand pitches a week. Um, so we're not able to process. I mean, we do have a process for going through them, but it's, it, it, there's so many and, and many of them don't really kind of work with our show. Um, we contact the person um, to see if they want to be on the show. And then we set up a background between the time that we contact the person and, uh, um, and we decided a person we contact them, we've already done some research on them just to kind of make sure that they're the right fit. I do a background call with them. Um, it's not on the record. And I basically explain how it's going to work. There's no uh, conditions. We, we, we want you to come to this conversation and to surrender. And we want you to talk about everything in your life. We want to, we're going to ask you a lot of things about detailed, granular details about your life. And a lot of it's going to be focused on your failures. And we want you to be open to talking about everything. If that's not, if you're not up for that, that's fine. And we, we don't want to force you to do this. And that's it. Then we schedule an interview a date. But at that moment, we begin a really deep dive into their life. We do, we go through tons of databases. We do tons of research. We even do background criminal checks on everybody, just so we know everything that there is to know in case we come up with something that we need to clarify um, in the interview. So um, I end up doing about probably between seven, sometimes 10, sometimes 15 hours of reading about every person I talk to. Oftentimes I know their story even better than they do. I know the dates. I, I just interviewed Ken, um, Kenneth Cole, the shoe, the, the, shoe brand, the Kenneth Cole, the guy behind the shoe brand. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a huge brand in the US. And he was talking about something that happened in 1996. And I said, actually, it happened in 1995, because I knew that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we do that because we, you know, it's, it's a single person story. 
And so we want to make sure that we um, were able to honor the story and the facts of the story as, as best we can, right? Because one person's narrative is, is obviously going to have some flaws in it. So our job is to kind of be there as a backstop to make sure it is accurate. Um, once we, we finish the interview, we, it can take three, four, sometimes five hours. Um, we transcribe it and then, and then begins the editing process, which takes many, many weeks, many edits, um, fact checking. We have a composer on our team. Um, well, he's not on our team anymore, has his own podcast now, Ramtin Arablui, and he composes original music for the shows. And then it's scored and produced, and then it's brought back to me to listen to it. And then there are more changes made. And then I write an introduction and I write the links between the first half and the second half. And then we master it. And then we put it out in the world and we make sure as best we can, everything is correct. The pronunciations, the dates, the facts, it's about a three month process for every episode of how I built this. And we do 45 a year, 45 main episodes a year. I think there are a couple of people in our podcast team whose minds you've just blown and uh, who probably just can't comprehend the level of, of, uh, of input and effort that goes into something like that. But I guess that's why it's one of the, the you know, the best listened to podcasts uh, around the world. Um, you know, you mentioned something interesting uh, earlier that, you know, you seek out people um, who have integrity and who've operated and started businesses uh, where they've been ethical and, you know, they, they being good and kind people along the way, um, even through some of their challenges. And I think there was probably about a, maybe a decade ago, there was this peak jobs sort of idolatry that was happening where people were walking around in black turtlenecks, treating people like crap um, and, and thinking that was the best way to get, you know, to get the best out of people in their organizations. But I love how you in the book and, and in the show as well, just, you know, kind of focus on, on the humanity and the, and the integrity of these founders. And I think I would have a really big challenge if, if, you know, I mean, I have so much respect and admiration for Steve Jobs' mind, um, like I do for other entrepreneurs out there. But I think I would, it would be a, a very difficult question for me to figure out what to do. Like if, if, if Steve Jobs were, were around, I mean, of course we would have him on how I built this, but we would have to have a frank conversation about his behavior. Because I mean, if you read Walter Isaacson's book, um, you know, you walk away from that. I, I think a lot of people walk away from that still admiring Steve Jobs, but he wasn't a nice guy, you know, all the time. You know, he was, he, he, he certainly was sometimes, but, um, and there are many stories of him actually being really nice, but he, he could be, cruel as well. And I, I think that um, there's a different model today. You know, I think even even in corporate leadership, um, you know, I don't I don't think that kind of behavior is acceptable anymore. It's not admired anymore. That kind of, um, you know, top down um, captain of the ship type of leader is really not seen as the, the kind of person you want to have running your company. I think it's a little bit of a cliche, but the idea of a servant servant leadership, I think, has really taken off in the past decade, certainly in the past five years, for sure. And it not only applies to CEOs, but also to founders of founders, CEOs of companies. And and I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I, I, I want to work for uh, if I if I'm working for a big company, I want to work for somebody who's human, who's open to to, to showing their vulnerabilities and also, um, uh, you know, and also somebody who has empathy because those I think those are skills that really um, are, are critical and crucial for for a business leader today and so that's that that's why we really seek those kinds of founders out guy I just want to check in with some of our attendees today who joined us and to find out where they're at in their uh, uh, entrepreneurship journey if maybe they're employed maybe they've got a side hustle and so we're just going to ask the team to uh, put up the poll and and see where people do what are they doing and 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 kind of get a bit of check in with our with our audience tonight and see what uh, where they are. Um, I want to go back to the launch of uh, or getting into how I built this right. And you know you had a pretty successful radio career. You were being broadcast onto eight hundred stations, uh, radio stations around the country, and 
you know, by all means, in, you know, immensely successful. Um, and then you had this idea to go into, into podcasting. Um, probably had a lot of people in your circle um, going, WTF, man, what, what are you doing? Um, and you talk about it in the book as, you know, part one is the call and, and this, this pull. Um, what was it like for you getting over the fear and the anxiety of, of, of jumping into this and, and starting your own production company? You know, one of the, I mean, the, 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 the real reason why that happened, why I left sort of traditional terrestrial radio and went into podcasting, what wasn't because I don't think it was because I had courage or I was brave. It really was the result of a failure and a failure that, that at the time was very difficult. But of course, it, over the course of my career has been an incredible stroke of luck. And that failure was my dream 10 years ago was to be the main news anchor um, on the radio, the, 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 the main, you know, on, on the main evening show to be the one of the, the, the presenters of that show. I was the weekend presenter and I wasn't part of the plan. My, you know, the organization NPR, which I used to work for, now I, I work with them. The, I wasn't part of the plan. The plan was not, <clears throat> excuse me, to to have me as the main anchor for a variety of reasons. I just, I, I didn't fit in. And so there was nowhere for me to go. I mean, I was the weekend presenter and there was no place for me to grow. And um, to me, it was very hard because it was like my dream to do that. That's what I thought. I thought that was the important job. And that I was living in Washington, D.C. And it's the kind of the news capital of the United States, not just the political capital. And um and I didn't know what to do. I thought I thought maybe I should leave journalism. You know, I, I was, just, as I say, it was just 10 years ago. But it forced me, <clears throat> excuse me, early in the morning here. Okay, better. It, it forced me to, you know, to, to kind of think about how to retake control over my career. And I was searching. I was, I was searching around for different opportunities. And, and at the time... I had heard about an opportunity to collaborate with Ted, as in Ted Talks, the Ted Talks people mm. who were looking to start a show. And I was looking to change directions. And I was also looking to, I, if, if I wasn't going to be doing that job, maybe I thought maybe I should leave the news world. And there were a lot of other things going on. I mean, this is even 10 years ago, you could already start to see the polarization in the United States really kind of begin to come into focus. And I didn't, I just didn't. I didn't like I didn't like what I was seeing. I didn't feel like I was making a contribution to more empathy and better understanding and all the things that I went into journalism for in the first place. Like I wanted to go cover wars and conflicts because I wanted I wanted to see if I could get, you know, Kashmiris, you know, you know, people in Kashmir um, feeling more empathy for the, for one another or Serbs and Croats or you know, Macedonians and Kosovars or Israelis and Palestinians. I really want, and, and I did, I went to those countries, you know, really Shia and Sunni. I really wanted to tell stories that could build empathy. And, you know, by the, by 10 years ago, I just, I, I got to this point where I was like, maybe I, maybe news isn't for me. And so I, I, I leaped at this chance to collaborate with, with Ted and start a show called the Ted Radio Hour. Um, and that really took me out of terrestrial radio and broadcasting. And, and you're right. I mean, at the time, a lot of my colleagues were like, what are you doing? You're going into what? Who listens to podcasts? Why would somebody listen to a show for an hour on one topic? And, you know, and I I was asking that question, too. I mean, I, I, I was I was thinking maybe this thing would last a year or two and then I'd have to find a new line of work. But of course, it didn't turn out that way. So it really, as I say, it it, it was. It was scary to leave all that behind, but it was almost like I, I had no other choice. I had to do it because I was I was feeling like there were all these obstacles in my way and I had to kind of chart a new path. And and so that's what happened. But that, the, the original idea of teaching business through stories um, goes back to, I guess your time at Harvard, when you had the opportunity to take up the Neiman Fellowship and spend a year there, um, just tell us a little bit about how that sort of, you know, became the the, the origin of, of of what would later become how I built this. 
Yeah, I mean, again, it was, again, another sort of um, the result of a failure in my career, which was 2007, um, <clears throat> I really wanted to be uh, a presenter on the radio. I'd already been a foreign correspondent for seven years. I covered the Iraq War and Af Afghanistan Wars and some conflicts in the Balkans and Israel-Palestine. Um, but uh, the powers that be at NPR at the time didn't think that I, I had what it took to be a host, a presenter. So at the, again, at that time, I thought, all right, I better start from scratch and find a new career. So um, I applied for this journalism fellowship, which I got, and it basically took me out of the out of the newsroom for a year. And I moved up to, to Boston and um, got to do this amazing fellowship. And uh, which uh, there's a South African, I think, on this fellowship every year, by the way. I think there's one slot reserved for a South African journalist. And uh, I took a class at Harvard Business School. I'd never taken a business school class in my life. <clears throat> and um, that's because journalists have this very cynical view of, yes, uh, right. of business <laughs> people, business in general, and, yeah. and definitely spreadsheets. Journalists think, of, think that people who go into business are just greedy and they're, you know, and I thought that too. So I took a class at Harvard Business School, and I'm thinking spreadsheets and um, you know abstract theories. First thing we get is a is is this um, packet. It's the story of Starbucks. It's the case study, and I'm just blown away. I'm thinking, wait, they teach business school like this? Like <clears throat> they um they teach it through stories? And I was fascinated reading the story of Howard Schultz and Starbucks. So it it planted this idea in my head over the course of that semester that you know, we could tell these stories somehow. You know, the, 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 this is essentially the core of how MBA students in the United States and the UK, probably even in South Africa today, are learning about business. They're learning about it through stories. And that's what I do. That's what we do. So it, it, that idea was planted in my head and kind of sort of sat there for seven years before I, I was able to kind of pull it back out and, and develop how I built this. Um, and yeah, that's where it comes from. You know, it's um, it, it's amazing that you know the case study method is is quite popular. It's been popularized in these business schools for a long time, but no one's really taken that and put that all together to create a, a book that is kind of almost end to end. These are the big themes that you need to know and and to use storytelling as the mechanism to say, hey, look, these are the things you're going to come up against. Uh, these are the big decisions you're going to need to make. And I love how in, in, in your book, you spend a lot of time going through, you know, these uh, personal dilemmas and big questions that you need to, that you're going to be faced with. And, and, and the first one is, um, you know, getting over the fear of just starting, you know, which is what holds so many people back. And if I think about the joblessness and the unemployment that we've had in, it's plagued our country for a long time. But now after COVID-19, we're going to see a lot more countries experience this, this massive challenge to get people back into work and to create new jobs. Um, and entrepreneurship is going to be the thing that does that. You know, if we allow corporates to just carry on without any uh, form of builders and entrepreneurs within their own, own organizations, the only way they're going to generate more profits is by replacing people with robots. Uh, and we don't need that. And and I know you're a fan of thinking about entrepreneurship as not just people who build companies, but, you know, almost this mindset. hundred percent. I mean, you know, I, I, I love everything you said. I completely agree with it. I mean, I think we're, we're facing now, not just in South Africa, but all over the world, and certainly the United States, you know, uh, some pretty, pretty strong headwinds, economic headwinds. In the U.S., um, many, many people, most people work for companies. They work for bigger organizations. There's nothing wrong with that, but a big part of the reason why is because of health insurance. You know, we have such a messed up system in the United States where health insurance is not universal. Um, and if you look at countries where health insurance is universal, there's actually a stronger entrepreneurial tradition, believe it or not, because people feel safer jumping and trying things out because they're not going to lose their coverage. He, here's the thing. We are now, I mean, if you think about entrepreneurship, and I guess we should define it, right? Because a lot of people, if they listen to the show or read the book, not the book, but they listen to the show, um, they might think that an entrepreneur you know, has to start Airbnb or has to start a billion dollar company. The 99% the of entrepreneurs around the world are solo proprietors, you know, single proprietorships. It's somebody who runs a corner store. 
It's somebody who's got, you know, an e-commerce business. It's somebody who's a handy handyman or woman. It's a plumber. That that's the beginning of what entrepreneurship means. It means it means sort of having some control over your own your own destiny, your own day, your time, you know, you being your own boss. And the other side to it is that it really is and what I've come to realize after interviewing, you know, incredible entrepreneurs like Howard Schultz and Richard Branson and, you know, Tony Shea of Zappos and the founders of Instagram and Airbnb and, you know, on and on, is that it ultimately is a mindset. You know, I, I don't believe that entrepreneurs are born. I don't believe that that you 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 emerge from the womb fully formed, you know, ready to take on the world. I, I think that all of us have the fear of going in out into the world and putting ourselves out there. And that's a very natural, normal human instinct. I think it's why we exist today. We have that instinct, you know, to protect ourselves for, for a very the very simple reason that we wouldn't be alive as a species if we didn't. But what it means is that we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of, um, you know, people questioning our ideas. And so if I went to you and I said, Stilly, I've got this awesome idea. I want to start this company. What I want to hear from you is that's awesome. Go do it. But I think most of us are afraid to to say that to people and and then to hear the response. Well, I mean, why do you think that's going to work? Or if it's so great, why haven't other people, you know, why hasn't anyone else done it? Or, you know, or how are you going to make that work? Or, or do you think you're going to, you know, do you have the money to do it or whatever it might be? Yeah. That's what holds most of us back. And, and it's what really kind of stops us in our tracks. The only difference between the people who've been on How I Built This and and the people I'm desc- describing, and by the way, I, I include myself in that too. I mean, I, I had to kind of break through that is, the only difference is, is that the people on my show somehow managed to just get past that and keep pushing forward, even despite hearing the, the doubters, despite hearing the no's and the rejection. They managed to push through and it wasn't easy. It It wasn't like they are, you know, more courageous or fearless than the rest of us. But I really think that it's the result of practicing. You know, I'm a big believer in in doing, in 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 learning by doing. I don't think that that the vast I mean, I can tell you for a fact the vast majority of entrepreneurs who've been on how I built this were not born to be entrepreneurs. They learned how to do it by failing, by hearing a lot of no's and a lot of rejection. Um, by experiencing a lot of, you know, setbacks and by just slowly pushing forward. One of the really interesting insights that I, I've, I've gained from the show is that a, a significant number of people who have gone on to become very successful entrepreneurs started out in sales. They were hired by a company or, or they on their own sold stuff. Sometimes it was door to door. You know, we just had an episode about Calendly, this amazing um, scheduling platform that anybody can use. It was started by a Nigerian named Tope Awatana. It is pronounced Tope. If you're Nigerian, I promise you that's how he pronounces his name, not Tope. And Tope, um, he started Calendly. It's an incredible brand. Well, he began his career in college at the University of Georgia selling alarm systems door to door. And he he would go to 500 houses a week and 490 of them would just slam the door in his face. But it, it helped him to develop this ability to hear no again and again and again, so that when he was in his 30s, he had already had a deck and, and he went on to become a sales rep for software companies. He already had a decade of hearing people say not interested, no, no, no. But he knew that um, that didn't matter, that eventually there's a hit rate. And that's really crucial. It's really important to understand that you will hear a lot of no's when you're starting out. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're starting out a, a little grocery store in the corner or you're selling flowers or whatever it is you're going to do. You're going to hear a lot, of, a lot of no's. A lot of people don't want your product, but but that's part of the process. And, and once you understand that, then it becomes so much clearer that you, you, you have no choice. You have to go through that. It's just it's part of the deal. And it, it, yeah. it somehow makes it less scary. I think the litmus test of, you know, what your entrepreneurship journey is going to be like is how you respond to the word no, uh, or it's never been done like that before, and we're not going to do it. And I think, as you say, it, it's about just practicing and getting used to that, accepting that that is the reality of 
of what this gig entails. Um, you know, like the Airbnb guys who, you know, uh, had their first 20 pitch attempts at, at, at fundraising in a time when, you know, venture capitalists were throwing money around and, yeah, and mean, were turned down. I mean, it's crazy. You know, can, can you imagine like in 2008, the, the founders of Airbnb go to 20 venture capitalists and they say, hey, you know, we've got this idea. Um, here's a prototype. We've already built it. We've self-funded on credit cards. Um, we need investors. You could have purchased ten percent of that company for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars U.S. dollars in the, in two thousand eight, which today would be worth you'd be a billionaire, m m multi you know, multi billionaire okay. if you own ten percent of the company <laughs> today. Um, and not a single investor invested in two thousand eight. In two thousand nine, same same thing. They they only started to gain some traction when they were admitted into this incubator Y Combinator which now is kind of legendary in Silicon Valley for incubating a bunch of different brands, um, DoorDash and Instacart and a bunch of other companies. But, um, you know, they, I mean, they, they, they just heard no, 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 no. And, and the reason why they heard so much no was because people looked at that brand and they said, who is going to want to stay in a stranger's home? How does that make sense? And it, you know, it really speaks to, our instincts, you know, we think that we have this with all of us, we have this bias and this bias, um, you know, it comes from our own experiences or wh whatever, whatever influences we have. And, and, and so our response to something like that is to look around us and say, that's impossible. That's not going to work. And that's, that's what they encountered with all these VCs and all these people they were, they were seeking support from. Um, of course, you know, today, <laughs> Um, you look at Airbnb and you think that's a no brainer. It's the biggest hotel chain in the world. I mean, if it's a hotel, if you think of it as a hotel, more people stay in an Airbnb on any given night than the top five hotel chains in the world. And, um, you know, even in the COVID crisis, which they've largely recovered from, um, it, it just speaks to this extraordinary idea of perseverance and of, of really believing in your idea and really understanding that you may have an idea that creates friction that um that you know is so disruptive that people actually are repelled by it or they just don't they don't see it or it offends them somehow Wh whatever it might be if that's the case you you may actually be onto something which is which is essentially the the, the moral of the story of airbnb um guy i'm just looking at uh, the results of the poll that we ran earlier asking people whether they're builders side hustlers or corporate climbers or nine of the above and we've got 32 percent of, of, uh, of our guests tonight are builders and 12 percent are side hustlers now i know you're a fan of side hustling Big right? fan. and kind of and kind of like this doesn't have to be an all-in thing you know mortgage the house uh spend the inheritance and the kids education fund and and, and jump in you know you you say, you know, do your research, but it doesn't have to be this big bang thing. And some of your, you know, some of the guests on on your show uh, took years to get going. Yeah, and and I'm a huge fan of side hustles. And I think of I think of, um, you know, I I I, th I mean, one of the stories I talk about in the book is the story of um, of Sam Adams beer, and 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 this is a really interesting story because in the early 1980s. American beer was, and some of you might watching might remember this. It was a joke around the world. Like a South African would never drink American <laughs> beer, right? Uh, I was you couldn't get it anyway because it was yeah. probably at that time there was a, a trade embargo. But the the fact of the matter is you wouldn't get American beer, right? You wouldn't drink it. It was mm. horrible. Yeah. And Jim Cook was a consultant at a very prestigious consulting firm. He was making a lot of money. He was in his mid thirties. He had two kids and, and a wife. On, you know, on the fast track to making partner, but he was miserable. He was absolutely miserable. He hated his job. It was so boring. And he was really worried that one day he would wake up and he'd be 65 getting ready to get his golden watch. And he would have regretted not having started his own thing. Well, he happened to come from a family of, a, he was a third or fourth generation beer brewer. His dad, basically when, when Jim Cook went to his dad and said, I want to start a beer company, his dad said, you're nuts. Like I worked my butt off to make sure that you didn't have to make beer because that that's why we were poor our whole lives. I mean, this was like, you know, I mean, this is the early eighties when, when, when two companies dominated 
American beer. They still do. But there was no craft beer revolution. Well, he decides to start this company, Boston Beer Company, and make this beer, St. Adam's Beer, according to the German Rheinsgeit Behot, whatever law, mm-hmm. you know, purity law. And lo and behold, it is so it, it it's so extraordinarily different from Budweiser and Coors. It's it's crisp and clean and, and rich and full. It's a completely different beer that Americans just aren't used to. Um, and it ignites an entire beer revolution, right? Today, American craft beer is like the envy of the world. It wins awards in Europe. It's incredible. I mean, you know, I go where I'm in normal times when I'm overseas, I always run into people who are just like, you know, who have got their favorite, you know, obscure American craft beer. He, Jim Cook didn't, didn't, start Boston Beer Company like one day. He didn't just leave his job. He started really slowly. You know, he, it was a side hustle. So at night and on weekends, he would research the industry. He would, and this is pre-internet, you know, now it's much easier. He would make calls. He would go visit um, bottling factories. He would experiment with recipes in his kitchen for months on end and saved his money. And so very slowly, you know, he started to dip a toe in and then a foot in and then, you know, and then a leg in. And then over time, he, he became confident enough after, you know, six or seven months to jump with both feet into that side hustle and make it his full time gig. But he didn't burn his bridges. He, he knew that if for some reason that ju- that the, the side hustle wouldn't work out, he could always fall back and go to consulting again. It's the same story with with Jane Whirlwind of Dermalogica, who, who actually lived in South Africa for a long time. You know, she she started this brand in 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 Los Angeles, this, this skincare brand. Um, but she knew that if it failed, she could always go back to being a, you know, doing facials. I mean, that's, that's what she was trained to do. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in this idea because I think that it's a really good way to test the waters when you're starting out. And, and now with e-commerce and with, you know, brands like Shopify and, and GoDaddy and whatever, where you can just put your store up and then everything is hand, they handle everything, logistics and marketing and, you know, all kinds of things for you. Um, it's really amazing. I mean, the barriers to entry for so many businesses, so many kinds of businesses, cosmetics, for example, um, even, even um, you know, natural foods products, the, the barrier to entry is so much lower because there are these companies now that only manufacture products and, and you know, white labeled products mm-hmm. where you can go to them with your ingredients and then make it and put it out there. So, um, so lo- a long answer to saying yes, huge fan of, of, of side hustles. And I talk about it in the book because I think it's a really important um, strategy to, to, to think about if you want to, if you want to try to build something on your own. Yeah. And, and we've actually adopted some of that thinking, you know, even within our own business is when we launch new products, you know, you can do it by just putting out a minimum viable product, seeing what the reaction's like, getting the data back from that and going, well, you know, do we put more effort behind this? Do we tweak it? Uh, do we iterate and put out an, an, a different version and see what 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 that's like? And once we learned how to do that, um, we've been a lot more successful at launching new products and new divisions and, and new efforts within our own within our own business, let alone starting a new one from scratch. Uh, I mean, 100 percent. Right. So, I mean, any and, and this is the thing a lot. What what this covid era has actually I think is actually unleashed. You know, it's it's a very it's been a very challenging time. I'm in I'm in Northern California. You know, I, I know that in South Africa and, and other countries where people are watching, it's it's challenging too, and it, there are different circumstances. But you know, the U.S. Has, has really failed in in fighting COVID. I mean, it is a really um, challenging time in this country. But I will what I will say about it is that it's really forced a lot of businesses to think very radically about innovation, and also to put out products and services that are not perfect, that are good enough, mm. that might fail, but that they're putting out there knowing that they have to serve their customers they and they have to survive. I mean, one of the coolest um, examples of this is a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed the founders of Zumba. And I know, I know people watching know what Zumba is. It's a fitness program, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the guys who founded Zumba, uh, um, amazing, these amazing guys from Ecuador, from um, Colombia, their business model relies on people, on, on fitness um, instructors paying a licensing fee to Zumba. Well, you know, fitness centers around the world shut down after COVID. 
And all of a sudden, Zumba saw its you know revenue model really kind of decline, and they saw their trainers really in, in trouble. So they mounted an online platform that enabled their instructors to offer Zumba classes online and to charge people. And by the way, Zumba doesn't take a cut of that money. They mounted that platform in five weeks. They completely invented it in five weeks. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't polished. It had rough edges, but they put it out there and it totally saved a huge part of their business. Now, now five months later, four months later, it's a much better platform. It's really good. Um, and lots of people are using it. And, and Alberto Perlman, the, the founder and CEO said to me, if they tried to do this last year during a normal time, Mm-hmm. It, it would have gone through, it would have taken two years. There would have been marketing meetings. Mm-hmm. There would have been all kinds of internal debates about what to do, whether it was going to work. There would have been a, a strategic plan. There would have been a rollout plan. It, w- it would have been a nightmare. And then in the end, it might not have been as good as what they put out in six weeks, you know? And I think that's really interesting and important. You're finding bigger organizations act like startups and also startups, um, you know, are, are a lot of smaller startups are able to kind of look at the situation and say, well, let's just try this, you know, let's try that. Let's, and not worry so much about making it perfect. And so in a sense, it, it's, it's one of the silver linings to this moment, which is if you're starting something now, it really is a time to kind of think radically about, you know, all different kinds of things you could do and, 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 and ways you could put your business out there um, that you might not have had the courage to do even a year ago. And by the way, part of that is because audiences, customers, consumers are a lot more forgiving now, especially when they know that businesses are really trying to meet them where they are. Yeah. And it's, look, there, there are a couple of uh, silver linings that hopefully we can carry on beyond this you know, phase and whatever the, the next phase of normal looks like in our, in our lives. Uh, there's a question from Robert Fancel, um, who says, who's asking which one of the founders that you've interviewed stands out as the most impressive there's one for him i'm not sure if you're allowed to answer this so like your kids where you actually do have a favorite but you you know you deny it in public um do you have a a favorite a favorite story or most impressive founder i mean i don't i don't sort of deny it to it's not that i'm denying it it's it's that i i love elements of every every episode i i just listened to uh Charles Mingus's son, Eric Mingus, give an interview, um, and he talked about how his dad would would listen to music, even if he didn't like the music, he always listened for like a snare drum or something in each piece of music that he heard that brought something out that, that, that sort of spoke to him. And I love that idea. Obviously, I love all of the stories we tell. I have to because I'm, I'm interviewing somebody for three, four, five hours. I'm, I know their story so well. You know, I just, as I mentioned, I just interviewed Kenneth Cole a few days ago um, about the shoe brand that he built. And that episode will air, you know, three, four, five months. Just an amazing story, beautiful story. We have an episode uh, coming out on Monday about Lush Cosmetics, the cosmetics company and that started in the UK. It's an amazing story. It's an epic journey. Uh, Mark Constantine was homeless when he was in his teens. I mean, he was a washout. He then made a quick fortune, sold it to Anita Roddick, uh, at the body shop, a business. And then he took that money, started a business and lost it all. He was bankrupt and broke at 43. He, had, he owed tons of money on his mortgage. I mean, and then he started Lush when he was broke. This is an incredible story. We have a story coming up in a couple of weeks about the McBride sisters. It's the largest African-American owned winery. It's an unbelievable story. One sister grew up in New Zealand. One sister grew up in Monterey. They shared a dad, an African-American dad, but different moms. They didn't know about each other's existence. They reconnected in their early 20s and and f- 15 years ago started a wine business, which is now exploding in growth. It's an amazing story. So, you know, there's so many different um, elements in every story that are so inspiring to me. And my what I try to do is to bring that to you. And, and so you hear somebody's story and you say to yourself, that's me. Like I am in that person. I have had that experience. I have been on the bathroom floor crying in the fetal position, just like that person that I respect and admire. That's incredible. That means that, 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 that my story is, is okay. Like I'm on the right track. You know, that's what I want the show to be. I want it to be for people. I want people to hear it and 
at, at the lowest moments of their their own journeys and 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 be reminded that the people they admire so much and, and the people that might even be the model for what they want to do went through that too went through phase times and, and long stretches where nobody would take their call you know so that's that that's that's the, the the sort of the real answer but if but if you want me to give you one person i'm going to give you one person and that is sal khan and sal khan he was we just had him on the show i've known sal a little bit um, for, for a few years and i interviewed him on ted radio hour my old show here's why i admire him so much so if you don't know who Sal Khan is, the founder of Khan Academy, and it's, I think, 20 million people a month use Khan Academy around the world. It's a free online educational platform. It's, I mean, they, everything, mathematics and economics and history, and it's incredible. My kids use it. I've used it. I've taken their intro to accounting class. It's unbelievable. It's 100% free. Sal Khan had three degrees from MIT at the age of 22. He grew up with a single mom in Metairie, Louisiana. His mother came from India. Didn't even know his dad. He, 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 he was recruited by the top hedge funds when he, he went to Harvard Business School. They all wanted him to work there on their quant funds because he's a math genius. He did it for a couple of years and he hated it. He never made a whole lot of money. He just hated it and he wanted to do something with meaning and purpose. And he started Khan Academy and intentional. Everybody said to him, Sal, you're a genius. Make this a for-profit. You're going to make millions and billions of dollars. He said, no, I want this to be a nonprofit. And he is more in – I think that he's had a bigger cultural impact on the world than virtually every founder I've had on How I Built This, with the exception of maybe Jimmy Wales, who also founded a nonprofit called Wikipedia. And, and that, to me, those stories are very, very important because Sal Khan is an entrepreneur building um, – Khan Academy was really hard and rough, and he went through long stretches of just being – just doubting himself and whether this was a smart idea, and he was broke, and he had to beg rich people that he knew from Harvard Business School to give him money, you know, and yet here he is today. He's not a – he's not a multimillionaire. He's not a, he's not a super wealthy guy. He's not wealthy, but he's doing something that's had such an impact on the world, such a profound impact that, you know – he told me the story about uh, pr how President Obama, the, the White House called him and invited him to the White House. And so he's thinking he's going to the White House, you know, with a, like a, for a round table. And, and he gets to Washington and, and he has a brief briefing with like one of the, the president's advisors the day before. And they're like, well, the president's really excited about having lunch with you tomorrow. And he's like, oh, well, who's going to be at the lunch? And they're like, no one. It's just, just you, Sal, you and President Obama. And he's like, but – I don't, I, I have no money. I'm not a donor. I can't, I can't, I can't help him out. And they're like, he's yeah. not interested in, in money. He just, he's not going to shake you down. He just wants to have lunch with you. You know, that's, that, that's Sal Khan. That's what makes him, he's such a remarkable person. So inspired by a story. And I actually wish more people thought of entrepreneurship in the way Sal Khan does. Yeah. And, and again, the point is, it's not whether you're in a corporate or in a nonprofit or a for profit. It's about, you know, this concept of building something, tapping into yeah. your creativity. And I think that's these really human stories that you've collected and been able to retell and, and you know, in the podcast and why we here in South Africa can, can sit and listen to stories about products that we don't know nothing about, but we can completely relate to those stories because it's really it's not about the product, it's about this journey and recognizing in each of those stories um, a lot of ourselves for those who are, who are building things or thinking about it. Um, I know that, um, you know, our founder of Daily Maverick, um, he has a favorite one and, and he reached out to me after he listened to it and said, you've got to listen to this one. This is us. This is our story. And um, and it was the Stonyfield yogurt guys. And I'm like, <laughs> like, we're in the news business. Like, how, you know, like, how do you get from yogurt to story? And I listened to it and I go, that, that's it. That is us. You know, these guys who were experiencing this, this massive growth, whose customers were loving the product, but just couldn't find ways uh, to, to, to finance the growth and to, you know, run, running out of credit cards, running out of, you know, friends, fools and family to finance the expansion and the growth and, you know, having 
uh, all sorts of um, you know, debacles and, and last minute doors being locked and having to deal yeah. with uh, all, all those things. And, and that was our that was our episode. Stonyfield Yogurt was was our episode where you could just rebrand that and you could put us on there. Um, and I think that's what you've done so well is is to take the human elements of those stories and 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 put them into our ears um, for us to connect with. I mean, the thing silly is that I don't believe entrepreneurs are superheroes. I believe that we are all, we all, and by the way, all of us, everyone watching this, listening, everybody on your team, we all have entrepreneurial capacities and qualities that we don't even realize we, we like, we're all solving problems every day. We're all thinking creatively. We're all trying to come up with different ideas. You know, um, I, I think that, that what it comes down to is like, who, you know, like what is what is it about the people on the show right what is it about them and the only difference is that they walked into the phone booth and put on the cape and then walked out and they were like i can fly now and we can all do that you know we and i, I mean and it, it it it's it's really i think the reason the, the, the fundamental reason why i wrote the book because i wanted to see if i could create a phone booth for people like me you know, me five years ago or 10 years ago, who's like, well, I would never, you know, I would never do anything like that. That's too scary. Um, but really it's, it's so much of it is about what's, what's holding us back in our heads. You know, we, we, we do have this capacity to, to create and to build, um, you know, in, in whatever way we want to. And I, I think that so much of it is just about, I mean, it sounds, cliche but so much of it is is about just believing that you can do it it's and i'm i'm not i mean this is not my idea we, we i mean there there have been books about this for hundreds of years you know people essentially saying a version of that and and what i'm doing now is is saying not only is it true but here are you know hundreds of examples of people who've done that and here's how they did it and here's what you can learn from them I want to take uh, a, an interesting question from one of the uh, uh, one of the audience, uh, Dirk Tolkien, uh, who's who's asking if you had to start a business in a country like South Africa, what problem would you look at solving? I mean, I I'm not I've never been to South Africa. I'd love to go. The furthest um, I've been to is to Tanzania um, for a TED conference actually a couple of years ago, which was really cool. Um, I'm I. My dream is to go to South Africa. We still and I talked about this and I will come and I will visit and I will say hello to all of you. Um, you know, I know that there are um, huge challenges and opportunities with healthcare in South Africa, um, with affordable healthcare like there is in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are probably huge opportunities when it comes to, um, um, you know, um, probably things like um, like finance, like my, especially microfinance, um, and and also ways to 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 to, to um, you know help to to support small businesses. Um, I think there are probably tons of um, you know again services, um, especially um, tech based services, um, you know business uh, technology services that probably um you know could support tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people especially affordable services my understanding is that you know there is a right i mean there like in any country there's a lot of income inequality so i i i i'm interested in 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 ideas that also serve a huge number of people that i think traditional businesses haven't thought of enough, you know, which is a, a massive consumer marketplace of people who may not be able to buy a $20 product, but may be able to buy a, a $3 product or a $1 product that actually serves them equally well. And I, I, I so I, I think that if I were to look at where the opportunities are, I would look at where, where the needs are. I mean, basically, and you know this, the, I, the, the way you come up with a business, right, is you look for a problem that needs to be solved or an opportunity that needs to be filled, right? So for example, you might be standing at a coffee shop or you might be standing in a, you know, at a takeout place to get some food. And you may notice something 
problematic about the experience. Maybe it's not efficient. Mm -hmm. Maybe the payment system isn't quite right. Maybe um, the way that um, they are serving customers isn't quite right. Maybe there's an inefficiency that you see and it sparks an idea in your mind. Like I can solve that problem mm -hmm. and I maybe I should think about how to solve that problem. That's sort of where the, the engines and the gears begin. The other thing I would say is I'm really inspired by the gold rush. And, and I talk about this a, a little bit in the book, and, and, and it's a, I think it's a really interesting way to think about how to create a business. Mm -hmm. If you come to San Francisco, where I'm talking to you from, from right now, the, the enduring brands are not Facebook and Salesforce and Uber, and you know they, they are obviously super important. But if you come to San Francisco today, the, the iconic locations in the city are Levi's Plaza and Ghirardelli Square, and Wells and Fargo, Wells Fargo Bank. These are businesses that were created in 1849, 50, 51, when tens of thousands of men came to California in search of gold. That's what built California. Well, you know how many people made money off the gold rush? Actually mining for gold? Almost none. The people who made the money were Levi Strauss, who was building the tents and selling denim jeans to the gold rushers, or Domingo Ghirardelli, who was making sweets and chocolates for the gold rushers, or Henry Wells and William Fargo, who created a courier service that enabled uh, you know, miners to send messages back and forth to their families. And they ended up building one of the biggest banks in the United States, Wells Fargo, Ghirardelli Chocolates, Ghirardelli Square, Levi's Plaza, Levi's Jeans. These are the enduring businesses. So I'm really interested in the idea of thinking about adjacent businesses, not going for the gold mine, mm -hmm. But thinking about the people going for the gold mine and how you could serve them, because that's really where there's there are amazing opportunities. And in the book, I'll, I'll just very briefly say mm -hmm. I described the story of Belkin, which is a company that makes peripherals and uh, cables to connect inner, you know, computers and printers and iPhones. And, so, you know, they don't make the iPhones and the computers. They make the things to connect them. And it's a multi-billion dollar company today. Yeah, uh, I think in the book you talk about when there's this massive queue to get into the front door, have a look around the side and see what else is going on there. And that could yeah. be your way into into the big time. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, and so I'm going to indulge uh, a very special person who, who hosts one of our podcasts. Um, it's called Don't Shoot the Messenger. Um, it's going to get to the, the kind of how I built this numbers in a couple of years, I'm sure. Um, anyway, the host, Rebecca Davis, um, has asked, uh, have you ever had to bin an episode um, after it's been recorded for whatever reason because a scandal hit or something happened and you were like, we just can't go out with this? Yeah, actually, it's happened probably about 25 times. So a lot. Wow. And it's very painful. And um, most of the time when that happens, it's because despite my, my best efforts, I can't, the person um, isn't willing to be vulnerable or isn't willing to really open up or can't or doesn't know how to or as hard as I try, they're just, um, they're not, they're, they don't have, they're not being generous with their story. Um, and it's very painful. We're really careful to avoid that because we don't want to bring somebody to the studio for three hours only to kill the episode. It happens. It has not happened often in recent years, but in the first two years, it happened a lot more. Um, and in virtually every case, we are very grateful that those stories didn't run. Um, because as I say, there are times when um, we do an interview um, and certainly it was earlier on when we did an interview and then later on discovered that maybe that person wasn't quite the person we want to represent what we do on the show and, and it didn't run. Um, and so, but you have to be prepared for that. It's really important. I, I think you have to be prepared to kill episodes that you you don't think are going to work well and and that aren't going to be a good use of your listeners time guy uh, i know we're almost at the end of our time and and i, I want to thank you for you know this time that you've spent with us there are hundreds of questions that have gone unanswered in Sorry. in the chat there um and i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna go out on a limb here and say i'm hoping that we can get you back for maybe another session where we can hook up uh, at one of our events down the line where we can get to some of these questions because there's so many comments and questions here that you know people would love your input on uh, to thank you for the inspiration that your show has helped them 
get through so many of those troughs of sorrow or to get over the line and to get started uh, to inspire uh, people in the podcasting space or uh, in the business space. And so, um, yeah, we're definitely going to going to reach out and invite you back to come and spend some time because you, you just you've got so much great insight and so many great stories. And I think the humanity in your storytelling um, is the most wonderful thing. And it comes through in your show and in your book. And I've read a lot of business books in my life and, you know, none of them come through in, in the way that yours does because it connects with what it is to be human, what it is to be vulnerable and to fail and to fear and to have anxiety about starting things or um, the rejection that goes with putting yourself out there in the world and saying, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try this. I want to, you know, I want to try to build something. Um, so we're going to get you back, hopefully. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and for this incredible book and for all the stories. And uh, if there's anything that we could do as listeners and as fans uh, to thank you for all uh, your effort to, that goes into that, it's to buy the book. Um, so we can you. do that. And let's just, <laughs> you know, Daily Maverick fans out there, how I built this podcast, finds it. I've read it. It's a brilliant book. You can do it. You can use it in so many ways in your life. Go out and, and get that. Thank you so much and um, really appreciate it. And I really want to come to South Africa. So once this COVID thing ends, I'm hopping on a plane with my family because I, I I, really, it's like if there's one country on earth that I want to go to, it's South Africa. It's like my number one choice. I really want to go there. So I hope I hope I can get out there. Well, consider it an open invitation. Uh, I know you and South African white wines have a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll do our best to, to host you out here as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tilly. Thanks, Guy.